Quería agradecerle a todos ustedes su presencia en, en esta casa, en la Fundación de Culturas. Para nosotros hoy es un día importante. Bueno, lo es siempre que presentamos un libro, porque los libros lo son en sí mismos. Pero la presencia hoy de, de Mona en Hatawi eh, creo que le da un plus sobre otros actos que hemos celebrado recientemente. Me gustaría en primer lugar agradecer la colaboración de la editorial Capital Swing, que colabora con nosotros, y también la colaboración de Casa África, eh, que tiene aquí una representación muy cualificada, que es la persona de, de Ángeles Jurado, sobre la que les pedí una palabrita. Bueno, Mona El Jatawi es la persona que probablemente esté liderando hoy el debate de la mujer eh, y del papel de la mujer en el mundo árabe. Eh, ella es colaboradora habitual de medios de comunicación muy importante como The Guardian, The New York Times, la ABC. Creo que muchos de ustedes conocerán su peripecia personal cuando en noviembre de 2011 fue golpeada, violada y detenida eh, por la fuerza de la policía antidisturbio egipcia y, y creo que a partir de ahí pues, se ha convertido por su activismo, en, en una persona enormemente reconocida en, en toda la lucha de las mujeres en el mundo árabe y en general en, en todo el mundo. Fue nombrada por Newsweek como una de las 150 mujeres valientes de 2012, Times la, la presentó como persona del año eh, y la revista Arabian Business la nombró como una de las 100 mujeres árabes más influyentes. El libro que hoy se va a presentar aquí, sobre que van a disertar después Ángeles y Simona, el, el, el IME y el IAP, ¿Por qué el mundo árabe necesita una revolución sexual? Es un libro, yo creo, muy importante, muy difundido. Está presentándolo aquí en España en estos días y en él realiza una condena definitiva de las fuerzas represivas, fuerzas políticas, culturales o religiosas que reduce a millones de personas, de mujeres, a la condición de ciudadanas de segunda clase. Eh, nosotros, de la Fundación de Cultura, que consideramos que la, las desigualdades de género suponen una afrenta a la dignidad humana, un desafío también al Estado de Derecho y a la democracia, y un obstáculo para el pleno desarrollo de las sociedades, estamos muy orgullosos de poder presentar hoy este libro. Y debo decir que en contra de lo que piensan ciertos círculos de, de pensamiento occidental, no tenemos ningún miedo a este debate. Yo creo que si hace falta una revolución de las mujeres en todo el mundo, también en el mundo árabe, y lo hacemos sin ningún, eh, sin ningún complejo, porque el problema de las mujeres árabes no es el Islam, es el patriarcado, al igual que los problemas en todo el mundo, que las mujeres no tienen que ver directamente con la religión. Otra cosa es que la religión o una interpretación incorrecta de la religión pueda contribuir o no a, al mantenimiento de ciertas estructuras. Pero el enemigo de las mujeres no es el islam, es el patriarcado. Y eso creo que conviene que quede claro, porque si no nos podemos confundir. Y, y creo que, que Mona está haciendo un gran labor en ese sentido y yo se lo bueno, quería decir eh, que nosotros, coherentes con esa eh, convicción, siempre hemos intentado traer aquí a la Fundación a mujeres muy destacadas. Yo quiero recordar eh, que estuvimos con nuestra, nuestra amiga ya mayor egipcia, Nahual Sadawi, eh, con la que tuvimos una jornada memorable en Granada, que es una gran activista por la, por la defensa de, la, de las mujeres y que nuestra biblioteca, que tienen ustedes aquí en la segunda planta, se llama Biblioteca Fátima Bernisi, otra gran mujer luchadora en favor de los derechos de, de la mujer. O sea que este acto, en cierta medida, es muy coherente con la trayectoria que viene desarrollando la Fundación de Culturas. Eh, este acto va a consistir en una conversación entre Mona Hatawi y, y Ángeles Jurado. Ángeles es periodista, actualmente es parte del equipo de comunicación de la Casa África, redactora del, del blog África no es un país y el portal Planeta Futuro del país 
y colabora con muchos medios eh, especializados como el canal Océano, África de la Vanguardia, Africaille, Mundo Negro, Artai, El Orden Mundial en el siglo XXI, Revista XXI, en fin, muchos otros, ella es canaria y muy amiga también de esta casa de la Fundación Tres Futuro. Me gustaría decir que esta actividad también se incluye dentro de la, de la celebración del décimo aniversario del Club de Lectura Tres con Libros y, y hay mucha gente aquí, como suele ocurrir, de, de nuestros clubes de, club de lectura, a la que, como siempre, quiero agradecer su presencia. Y para terminar, recordar que vamos, los libros están ahí para venderse. Yo siempre lo digo, el mejor destino de los libros es ser leídos y para ser leídos normalmente salvo que lo pueda de la biblioteca y comprarlos. Eh, voy a decir una frase del libro de, de Mora que me ha llamado la atención, cuando todo el mundo llama la atención, pero cuando una chica egipcia cuenta cómo le impactó el relato de Mona, de su, de su humillación, de su detención, y entonces se dio cuenta, y ella dice de qué se dio cuenta. Se dio cuenta, dice el libro, no puedo decidir nada y nada depende de mí. Y a partir de ahí, eh, dice cuenta Mona cómo esta chica se convirtió también en una activista en favor de la mujer. Así que eh, adelante con, con el GH y espero que sea muy satisfactorio para todos ustedes. Gracias. Muchas gracias, buenas noches a todas y a todos. Eh, le estaba, bueno, hace un momentito, una alta Javi se ha sacado un selfie conmigo y con Olga que está por allá y le he dicho que hasta el momento en que pueda sacar un selfie con Iris Helva, este es el selfie más maravilloso que, que pido en la liga. Entonces, como está bastante nerviosa para la ocasión, es un placer enorme estar aquí, pero también es un poquito imponente, es que unas palabras y preferiría leerla antes de empezar por la conversación de aquí. Bueno, es un placer y un honor para mí encontrarme entre ustedes esta noche en Sevilla, en el marco de esta preciosísima Fundación de Cultura y Galadera de Juan Manuel Cervera y sobre todo de Juan Altajago. Quería aprovechar el momento para agradecer a la Fundación de Cultura y especialmente a Olga Cuadrado y a mi compañera Estefanía Castines, que es la hija del, del Departamento de Mediática en Casa África, por haber maquinado este acto en el que colaboramos. Esta noche, ustedes y yo ejercemos de pegamento humano para reunir a dos instituciones muy especiales, la Fundación de Cultura y Casa África que arrancamos nuestros respectivos clubes de lectura hace una década ya, como comentaba antes, y durante estos 10 años hemos trabajado juntas para acercar la literatura que nos interesa y que hace el mundo un poquito más diverso a grupos cada vez más amplios de ciudadanos. Hoy celebramos nuestra década de complicidad especialmente de la mano de Antonio Lozano, parte de nuestras respectivas almas y de nuestras trayectorias, de, de, de nuestras relaciones de sus inicios, pero también eh, parte de lo que va a ser nuestro futuro. Hoy nos reivindicamos como dos gentes que tienen una hermosa vocación compartida, que es unir, dialogar, relacionar, eh, facilitar y hacer el mundo mejor. Exactamente igual que Muna El Tajabi, la mujer que nos convoca esta noche aquí, armada con un pelo hecho y amarada, ardiente igual que su palabra, siempre dotada de exactitud y pasión, de miel y de fuego. Eh, comencé a seguir a Muna El Tajabi en Twitter hace años y le recomiendo que si pueden y quieren tener una vida virtual mucho más intensa e interesante, lo hagan también. Comparte información, se indigna, lanza proclamas feministas en vídeo, denuncia, se compadece, razona y se solidariza. Es fuego que reduce a cenizas a los misóginos, los obtusos y los intolerantes. Es la mía que tapa las heridas de quienes sufren el prejuicio. Precisamente en redes sociales he podido observar cómo se ha ido creciendo con los años cada vez más determinada y combativa en las batallas y cómo es planta de muchas maneras diferentes y en muchos territorios distintos. En las redes sociales Twitter es, es la favorita para mí a la hora de seguirla. Allí supe del libro que hoy nos reúne, se lo pedí a Estefanía, la jefa de la Mediateca de Casa África, para la Mediateca de Casa África y en cuanto llegó eh, le eché mano antes de que siquiera lo catalogaran o le pusieran el recuelo, que entrara a formar parte de, de nuestra mediateca. Me lo llevé a casa, empecé a leerlo, me fascinó, me abrió un mundo nuevo, empecé a subrayarlo y ya no podía entregarlo en casa África, así que compré uno nuevo y, y lo repuse. Eh, también allí descubrí que en, 
una artista que Capitán Swing lo traducía al español y lo publicaba. Y pasamos por el mismo proceso con la versión en español que con la versión en inglés. Eh, en Twitter he visto que una de estas aguas se va africanizando. Frecuenta ferias y salones de libros en países como Nigeria. Ah, antes estamos hablando como Sudáfrica, hasta en Ruanda. Eh, comparte mesas con escritores y escritores a quienes admire, admiro y leo. Y prende en nuevos territorios juegos de sororidad y de tolerancia. En Twitter he hablado con ella proponiendo un encuentro de historias que hasta hoy no se habían materializado, pero que espero que en el futuro sigan eh, convirtiéndose en realidad. En Twitter empiezo a soñar su nuevo libro que saldrá a finales de año y que nos invita a que seamos pausenas, rebeldes y libres. Eh, estamos aquí para oírla a ella, eh, así que aquí me detengo con mi primera petición de la noche. Por favor, multa, una gente a uno. Explícanos tu credo. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to start with my declaration of faith. This is a declaration that I make everywhere I go, wherever I speak. And my declaration of faith is fuck the patriarchy. <laughs> I'm very glad to be speaking in this beautiful centre, this beautiful building. So I'm very grateful to Olga and everyone involved in the centre, and to Capitan Swing, and to Angelis, who I will be in conversation with today. And I'm especially honoured that the library is called the Fatima the Nisi Library, because Fatima the Nisi was one of my feminist heroes. I write about her in my book. I also write about Noam Sandawi, as you heard, the center has hosted her. And those two women especially have been heroes, older sisters, in the fight against patriarchy. So what do I believe in, you want to know, right? I believe in the destruction of patriarchy and mess. This is my goal. This is what all my work is aimed at doing. And I'm especially grateful that as you heard in the opening talk, that this is about patriarchy. This isn't about my culture versus your culture. This isn't about Spain versus Egypt. I never travel anywhere outside the region so that in Spain or in the UK or in Belgium where I was last week, people can say, oh no, there's poor Muslim women. Oh no, there's poor women in Egypt and Saudi Arabia. What are we going to do for them? That's not why I come here. That's not why I travel. I travel around the world because we all face patriarchy. I travel around the world to remind people that if you think it's shit over there, it's shit over here too. That we fight patriarchy over there and you must fight patriarchy over here. So that is also one of my goals. One of my goals is to um, make clear to people that patriarchy is like the head of an octopus. And it uses the tentacles of the octopus to strangle us with various forms of oppression. So those eight arms of the, of the octopus can be capitalism, racism, religion, um, homophobia. It can be a variety of oppressions, but they are controlled at the head of the octopus by patriarchy. So I always urge audiences wherever I go, find out what patriarchy is using against you, And instead of fighting those eight tentacles, fight the head. And the head is patriarchy. Eh, en la, lo que es el pro de la edición española de su libro, eh, empieza hablando de la situación de la, los resultados de las primaveras árabes y sobre todo cómo las primaveras árabes han fallado a las mujeres. Y habla también de la conexión entre lo político y lo personal entre el hogar y la calle. ¿Por qué? ¿Cómo han fallado las la primaveras árabes a los ciudadanos que las han vivido en general y a eh, mujeres en especial? ¿Y por qué existe esta conexión entre lo público y lo privado, lo personal? Cuando la revolución empezó en 2010 en Tunisia, everyone I knew, o everyone I know, was ecstatic. It was like a dream come true. For so, so many years, many of us across the region knew that we deserved to be free. We knew that outside the region we were often looked at as people who like the strong arm dictator. No one I know likes the strong arm dictator. I think the governments in Europe and the governments in North America 
who sell weapons to our strong armed dictator, like our dictators more than we like our dictators. So when our revolution finally began, we said, this is what we've been dreaming of all of this time. And you saw men and women going out into the streets of Tunisia, the streets of Egypt, Libya, Bahrain, Yemen, Syria. Yemen, which is considered one of the most conservative countries in the region. You had women side to side with men. So this was a clear indication as across the world, men and women risked their lives together to fight the dictatorship of the state. I wrote this book because I wanted to ask what happens when the revolutionary, especially the man, goes home. Is he a revolutionary at home as well, or is he a dictator at home? And I, especially in Spain, I like to share a, a quote from, I'm obsessed with the Spanish Civil War. I say this everywhere I go, and I'm sure lots of foreigners come to Spain and say, I'm obsessed with the Spanish Civil War, but it, it's an incredible time in your history that continues to teach us a lot today, especially now with so many right-wing fascists being uh, rising to power across the world, including the fascist fuck in the United States, as I call him, Donald Trump. So, um, in Spain, as part of the anarchist movement, because I identify as an anarchist, there was a group of women called La Mujeres Libres, the free women of Spain, and they were part of the CNT, and they would organize women in the factories, and they would organize women at work, in a combination of anarchism and feminism, which is my combination, anarcho-feminism. And one of those women from La Mujeres Libres said something that I think is perfect for the reason why I wrote my book. And she said, the compañeros, our comrades, were very good at revolution in the factory, in the coffee shop, in the streets. But when the compañeros went home, it's as if they took off the revolution with their shoes. And inside the home, they were no longer compañeros. So this is the question that I wanted to ask in my book. Are you a revolutionary at home? And I would ask, you know, I would say, where is the feminism in your revolution? And so many of my compañeros would say, ah, this is not the time. Come on, there's 60,000 political prisoners in Egypt. There's torture in Egypt. The environment, education, the streets, the traffic, blah, blah, blah. This is not the time. And I'd say, how can you say it's not the time where 50% of society they would say, wait, wait, wait. So I understood that they were not going to fight for the feminist revolution. And their biggest excuse was, anyway, nobody is free. And I would say, yes, you're right, nobody is free because the state oppresses everyone. The state oppresses men and women together. But the state and the street and the home together oppress women. So the men's revolution was to fight for power against the state because that's all they could see was oppressing them. But my revolution, and the revolution that we all need, the feminist revolution that will liberate us all, is the revolution against the dictator in the presidential palace, against the dictator in the streets, and in the, against the dictator in the bedroom. And this is why I wrote my book, and this is why when you look at the revolution in the region now, obviously Syria is a terribly tragic example of how a, non a beautiful, non-violent revolution began against a terrible dictatorship but that beautiful revolution was stolen from the Syrian revolutionaries by so many people. But when you look at the other countries that haven't broken out into civil war, in Egypt, for example, we're stuck. We're stuck because it's the men looking at the state, trying to figure out how much power they can get. So it's one group of men against another group of men. And it's the military versus the Muslim Brotherhood. And I don't want the military, which is fascism with a gun, and I don't want the Muslim Brotherhood, which is fascism with religion. And when I speak in Spain, I remind people that this is like what you had under Franco. You had a military dictatorship that was supported by the Catholic Church. You know what that does to a country, and this is what I'm fighting against. So the revolution politically is stuck, but the revolution in the sexual sphere and the social sphere is moving. And that's the revolution I fight for. También en el libro, cuando ya empieza lo que es el eh, comienza con la narración de cómo te conviertes en feminista. Bueno, comienza con otras cosas, con tu evolución, pero eh, una de las primeras cosas que me llama la atención es cómo te convertiste en feminista, además en un sitio tan poco propicio como Arabia Saudí. Y eh, cómo descubriste autoras como Fátima Mernisi, hace poco estaba en la biblioteca aquí, que se llama también Fátima Mernisi. Estabas hablando de cómo el, 
la biblioteca de tu, de tu facultad, encontraste obras de Fátima Mernizzi, de Nahual al de gente de la, que, que consideraste que esa es una especie de subversiva, saboteadora, había colocado en las estanterías de, tu, de, tu, de la biblioteca de tu universidad. Eh, ¿Podrías explicarnos ese devenir feminista, cómo las circunstancias en que se produjo y cómo te encontraste con el feminismo en Arabia Saudita? Yes, people are often surprised when I say I became, I discovered the word feminism in the library in Saudi Arabia. My family, I'm from Egypt, I was born in Egypt, but my family moved to London when I was seven because both my parents are medical doctors. They met in medical school in Cairo and they got married after they graduated and both my parents got scholarships from the Egyptian government to study for a PhD in London. So we moved to the UK for both my parents. And then when I was 15, my parents moved us to Saudi Arabia where they both got jobs to teach in medical school. And it turned my world upside down. Because I learned when we moved to Saudi Arabia that there are many Islams. There isn't one Islam. Because the Islam that I was raised with at home was an Islam that produced my parents. A mother and a father who both were doctors, who met in medical school and who were each other's equals and took us to London, and then took us to Saudi Arabia, where they would teach future generations of doctors in Saudi Arabia. So I grew up at home with the message that the most important thing in life is knowledge. And I saw this with my parents. And for the sake of knowledge to give to others, my parents moved us to Saudi Arabia. And I was 15 years old, and my world turned upside down. Because very soon after we arrived, and I saw that they were practicing a very different Islam, to the one I have at home. It felt like being a girl or being a woman in Saudi Arabia was the walking embodiment of sin. And I realized that that's when my fight against patriarchy really began in full earnest. But I didn't have the word feminism. I discovered the word feminism when I was 19 at the university library. And I'm glad that the library here is called the Fatima Manisi Library. Because in the library one day when I was 19 years old, I discovered feminist journals. And in those journals were the writings of women from my background, from my culture, from my faith background, like Nawal Sadawi from Egypt, Fatima Manisi from Morocco. And they gave me the word for what I was experiencing. And the word was feminism. And it terrified me. I was terrified because I recognized that once I pulled at this thread called feminism, it would undo everything. There was no turning back. So I would go to the library every day and I would read something and I would be terrified and I'd put it down and I would run away and then I'd come back again and again. And it was an important message that sometimes the things you need the most are the things that terrify you the most. So you should just accept the terror and jump. And it's, it's really significant that someone in that library in Saudi Arabia put those journals there because there's no women's and gender studies program in the university back in, in, this was in 1988, no, no, 1987. This was in 1987. No one was teaching. To this day, there are no women's and gender studies programs. And yet, there were feminist journals in the library put by a revolutionary, I believe, who wanted us to see this. And it's very significant that today we're talking as Saudi activists, Saudi women's rights activists, are being put on trial in Saudi Arabia by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who is the de facto leader of Saudi Arabia. Now, I know that Spain tried to cancel an arms deal with Saudi Arabia quite recently because um, these arms are being used to commit war crimes in the war in Yemen. And I know that the arms industry in Spain complained. We were talking about this earlier. But you really should stop selling weapons to this terrible regime, the Saudi world family. Because this new leader of Saudi Arabia pretends to be an emancipator of women, and that is bullshit, as I said. He is not. He belongs to an absolute monarchy, and in May of last year, and this is to, to, to make you realize that there is feminism in Saudi Arabia that you don't hear about. In May last year, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman sent to prison three generations of feminists in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia did not have a revolution like Tunisia and Egypt and Libya and Syria, but there is a feminist revolution happening 
and the Saudi regime is fighting it. And those women have been in prison since May, they have been tortured, and they've been put on trial. So I urge you all, as citizens of a democracy, to remember first of all that there is feminism in this kingdom of Saudi Arabia, this kingdom of the patriarchal royal family, and that your government here, with your vote, sells weapons that harms the people of Yemen, that Saudi Arabia is fighting, and that keeps this absolute monarchy in power to crush feminism and other forms of dissent. Les estoy hablando de eh, el feminismo en Arabia Saudí y del feminismo en el mundo árabe en general. En el libro también reivindica el conocimiento producido por mujeres eh, musulmanas, mujeres árabes a lo largo de la historia durante el siglo, la poesía, eh, el arte, obviamente la literatura, pero también el conocimiento científico, el conocimiento de todo tipo y el feminismo. Y reivindica que son las propias mujeres musulmanas son las propias mujeres árabes las que tienen que salvarse a sí mismas, las que tienen que encontrar su futuro, su destino, su realización. Eh, esta idea eh, creo que es muy importante repetirla en un contexto en el que verdaderamente la situación de las mujeres musulmanas, de las mujeres en general, pero bueno, especialmente de las mujeres musulmanas, con la carga de eh, eh, islamofobia, de racismo, de xenofobia que se está instalando en muchos países en estos momentos del occidente, eh, se considera que son un pretexto para atacar a determinadas culturas, a determinados países, a determinadas formas de, eh, de vida sociales y, y, se, y, y se considera que son personas sumisas, pasivas y que no tienen capacidad para luchar por sus propios derechos. ¿Qué tienes que decir al respecto? Aunque ya has hablado sobre el tema. One of the things that I wanted to do uh, most vehemently in my book is to show that we have a heritage of feminism in my part of the world. That we don't need to import feminism from the Met, from the West. We don't need to imitate Western feminism or what we now call white feminism. We have a feminism that began in Egypt, for example, in the 1920s with a feminist called Hoda Sharawi who in 1923 was attending a feminist conference in Italy. Now imagine this, I'm, I'm sure most people, probably inside the region, not just outside the region, have no idea that a group of Egyptian women was, was, was traveling to Italy to attend an international conference of feminists from around the world. So Egyptian feminists went to this conference and one of them returned to Cairo and very famously removed her face veil this face veil that we're still fighting over a hundred years later, in 1923, Hoda Shahrawi removed her face veil and said, this is a thing of the past. And she and her fellow feminists fought for the education and the, 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 the rights of fellow women in Egypt. I also mentioned in my book that in the 1950s, another Egyptian feminist who traveled the world, called Doreya Shafi, stormed the Egyptian parliament with 1,500 women from her feminist group to demand the right to vote. And we have the right to vote in Egypt because of these women. Because two years later, they went on hunger strike, just like the English women, who in the 1920s went on hunger strike to get their political rights. So we have generations of women who have been feminist activists in my part of the world. And that's to remind people in my part of the world that when they accuse me of importing an idea that is alien, to my culture or alien to my religious background, I say to them, no, I'm not. Because there is Khodosh Arabi in the 1920s, and there, there is Doreya Shafi. And even earlier, even further back, I also mention that because, because my book is subtitled Why the Middle East Into Sexual Revolution, and I talk about sex a lot, because I believe that, especially as feminists, we must own our body, and we must own our sexuality, and we must own our right to sexual pleasure and to sexual joy, because this, these are things that patriarchy denies women, whether in Spain or the US or Egypt, especially the conservatives and the right wing who want to ban abortion. They want to ban abortion to control our reproductive rights, but also to punish us for declaring openly that I have pleasure and it is my right to enjoy sex. So when I talk about sex, I'm again told, how can you talk about sex? 
this is disgusting, this is Western, this is white, this is not our culture. And so in my book, I quote from the poetry of Arab and Muslim women from the 7th century, from the 12th century. I quote from Muslim women poets from Andalusia, who lived here in the 12th century, who wrote courageously and boldly about sex and pleasure and owning their bodies, who would tell their husbands, come here now and fuck me three times in poetry in the 12th century. So I asked my book, why have we denied ourselves this heritage? And why has this heritage been erased? And it's been erased by patriarchy. So I am not imitating anything from the West. I am instead re re rediscovering, for me, and my co-Muslim women, and my co-Arab women, and my co-Middle Eastern women, our own heritage that we must claim with pride. Que también en el título de su libro, en la traducción en, en, en español, ya y el Imen, o, o el Manuelo y el Imen, en, eh, se menciona el tema del velo que acabas de, de sacar. Eh, tu relación personal con el velo también aparece en este libro como una decisión que tomaste en un momento, ponértelo, y ocho años más tarde. Después de mucha reflexión y de una serie de experiencias, quitarte esto. Pero fue una cuestión reflexionada, pensada, sentida, de una manera muy especial. Estamos habituados aquí, en, en los países occidentales, a ver a mujeres pasearse con sus manos, con sus velos, sin darle mayor importancia. Se ha convertido en un eh, símbolo para algunas personas de, de, que provoca eh, islamofobia, que provoca racismo, que provoca cosas bastante desagradables. En Francia, por ejemplo, se ha prohibido, se había prohibido el tema de, de mantener este símbolo religioso en lugares públicos, en lugares. ¿Qué sentimientos te provoca el velo a estas alturas de tu vida, de, de tu evolución y, y cómo lo ves en, en otras personas, en otras mujeres que tienen una trayectoria diferente, que tienen una, una decisión de importarlo o no importarlo, cómo, cómo lo valoras? The reason I called my book Headscarves on Island or Hyphen and Hijab, as you have it in Spanish, is because I am fed up of Muslim women being reduced to what's on our head and what's in between our legs. I called this book Headscarves and Highlands because I want everyone to know that I am more than my headscarf and I'm more than my hymen. And to answer your question, I often give the very personal examples of my own family. My mother, who is this woman, who was one of the reasons that we went to London so she could get a PhD with my father, chose to wear the hijab for reasons of piety. She believes that this is an obligation of a Muslim woman. I chose to wear the hijab initially, when I was 16 years old, out of piety, but I quickly discovered that I disagree. I read and I discovered that there were many different opinions, and I stopped believing that this was an obligation. Because there are no actual words in the Quran that say, you will cover your hair. But there's a particular verse, there are several verses, and Fatima Bermisi was especially useful for me because she wrote two books about Muslim women and the hijab that I'm sure are in your library. And she talked about how these various verses in the Quran have been interpreted in different ways, but the male scholars like to imagine and to convince us that it's just one way, and that is cover your hair. So I began to disagree with that, and I wanted to take off my headscarf very soon after, and also I missed the wind in my hair. I did not want to imagine that I would never feel the wind in my hair for the rest of my life. And so I wanted to take off my hijab, but it was very difficult. So I discovered that it is easier to choose to wear a headscarf than to choose to take off my hijab because it took me eight years to take off or to stop wearing hijab. So I began to wear it at 16, I stopped wearing it at 25. And then the third example from my own family is my sister, who is 19 years younger than me. She just recently got her own PhD in English literature. And she chooses to wear the hijab to say fuck off to the racists. For her, it's an identity. She wants people to know that she is Muslim and proud. And we disagree. 
I disagree with my mother, I disagree with my sister, they disagree with me. But I'm giving you those three examples by way of explaining how complicated the hijab is for Muslim women. And too often, we are reduced to a picture of a burqa equals Muslim woman. Or a Muslim woman can only be talked of in the context of hijab. And we are more than our hijabs. So I am now at the stage where I am so fucking fed up, if I say, of being reduced to the hijab that I say, if you are not a woman of Muslim descent, shut up and listen to Muslim women. Because then you will see that in the context of, say, Iran, where over the past few months, women have been arrested and put on trial because they, re they removed their hijab, and in Iran there is compulsory hijab. Over the past few months, women in Saudi Arabia have been taking film of taking off their niqab, their face veil, and setting it on fire. And for another context, women who live here in the so-called West as part of Muslim communities that are minorities now. In Iran and Saudi Arabia, women are live as majorities. Here in the so-called West, Muslim people live as part of minority communities. The situation for women and hijab here is quite different because they become what we call visibly Muslim. So you can see in the way that my sister wants to be seen. But this also puts them in a great deal of danger when it comes to violence against Muslims. It's easier to find a Muslim woman because she's wearing a hijab, if she's wearing it, than to find a Muslim man. So they are often the target of Islamophobic racist violence. So I tell you all of these stories by way of saying it's complicated. And one of my missions alongside destroying the patriarchy is to complicate the image and the story of Muslim women. Because when you reduce a Muslim woman to a hijab or a niqab or a burqa, you dehumanize us. And when you dehumanize us, you deny us the full life that you wish for yourself. So I insist that you complicate, that you see us as more than our headscarves, and that you listen to us and all the various arguments, and believe me, we argue, all the various arguments that we have that make this symbol something so small, because we are much bigger than that. definiéndote como feminista, anarquista, feminista, laica. Sin embargo, en el libro eh, hablas de Fátima Bernisi, dando una interpretación diferente al de los maquillajes. Hablas de, eh, frente a la pedofilia disfrazada de matrimonio temprano, matrimonio precoz, puedes tener el ejemplo de Isabella, la primera mujer de Mahoma, que era 15 años mayor que él, que era una mujer que fue su mecena, una mujer sabia, fuerte, ese tipo de mujer. Hablas de, frente a la mutilación genital femenina, eh, versos que um, indican al hombre que tiene que también se hacer sexual, sexualmente a la mujer, que el sexo debe ser placentero para los dos. Entonces, feminiza el, el Islam de alguna manera, a pesar de que no te declaras feminista musulmana, eh, ¿por qué hacer este ejercicio? That's right, I don't call myself an Islamic feminist. I keep Islam and feminism very separate. And I do that because anything in 2019 that hurts women and girls, I will fight. Whether it comes from Judaism, Hinduism, Islam, Donald Trump, the EU, the Saudi Arabian royal family, anything in 2019 that will hurt women and girls, I will fight until I destroy it. I would love to destroy it on the drum. <laughs> but um, in my book, I mention many Islamic feminists, women and scholars who do identify as Islamic feminists. And I do it for two reasons. One reason is that in 2009, I went to the Malaysian capital, Kuala Lumpur, to attend the launch of a global movement called Musawa. And Musawa is the Arabic word for equality. And this is a global movement for equality and justice in the Muslim family. And that movement is like an umbrella. And underneath that umbrella stand women like me, who are secular feminists to keep Islam and feminism apart. But also under that umbrella are Islamic feminists, like one of my heroes, Amina Wadud, who is the American scholar of Islam. 
And the reason that I quote Islamic feminists, even though I myself am not, is because I recognize that patriarchy uses everything against me, and so I am determined to use all the weapons I can use against patriarchy. So that includes the weapons of Islamic feminists. And I do that also because I recognize that patriarchy exists within religion. Most religions are patriarchal, especially the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They, sh they share so much in common when it comes to patriarchy and misogyny. So yes, there is patriarchy inside religion, but there's also patriarchy outside religion. And too often people say to me, ah, just tell these women to leave religion, as if that will solve everything. First of all, not everyone wants to leave religion. Some people genuinely feel a power from their religious faith. Some people genuinely feel a great deal of comfort and um, inspiration and strength from their religious faith. Who am I to tell them to leave their religion? Secondly, some people can't leave their religion. Their life would be in danger, or they would lose their families, or so many other reasons. So, I am not going to tell them to leave their religion if they want to stay in it, but I want to give them the weapons to fight patriarchy where they stand, in the same way that I fight patriarchy where I stand. So Islamic feminism, in that sense, for me, is a very useful weapon against the patriarchy that exists in the sacred space. So of course I will use it. And just to give you an example of the power of the kind of work that Islamic feminists do, in 2005, Amina Wadud, who I said is one of my heroes and I mentioned in my book, and I mentioned her in my next book, she's a scholar of Islam, a long time scholar of Islam, and in 2005 in New York City, she led us in prayer. She became a female imam. Now, like in Catholicism, there are no women priests. In Islam, there are no women imams. There is no reason that there shouldn't be a woman in American Islam, but there isn't. And Amina Wadud, who has studied the religion very well, said, I have enough scholarship to be an imam. And there is nothing that says this is prohibited. So in 2000, March 2005, almost exactly 15, 14 years ago now, in New York City, she was the imam, and there were 50 women, including me, and 50 men who prayed behind her in Juma, the Friday prayer. The person who gave the call to prayer, the Adhan, was a woman, and the Imam was a woman, Amina Wadud. The woman praying next to me was from Somalia, and she was crying the entire time, because in Somalia she can't even go to the mosque, let alone have a woman be the Imam. So here she was, praying behind a woman Imam. I was one of two women praying without my headscarf, and I prayed on my period, which is a big taboo. To have this prayer, I was part of a movement in the United States called the Progressive Muslim Union of North America. To co-sponsor this prayer, we sent out messages to Muslims across the country. And some of them wrote to us and said, give me the religious justification for a female imam. So Amina Wadud, who is an Islamic feminist, had it ready. There were others like myself who said, I don't need a religious justification, I am going to go. And others like me, well, two of us, who prayed without our heads off, and I prayed on my period. And when people ask me, who gave you permission to pray on your period, I say, I gave myself permission to pray on my period. So you have here, just like I gave you with my mother, my sister, and myself, a variety of experiences. The Islamic feminist, the secular feminist, creating a revolution. Because after Amin Wadud led that Friday prayer, there have been other female imams, there have been mosques that are led by women, leading, uh, praying in front of men and women. There have been mosques where LGBTQ Muslims who are gay and bisexual and transgender and Muslim and will not give up their religion just because they are LGBTQ. There are mosques that make space for them. There are mosques where they lead prayer. And all of this, thanks to a large part because of the revolution of Amina Wadud. And to show you how terrified patriarchy is of feminism, Islamic feminism, secular feminism, after this prayer, the Arab League was meeting for another reason. And Gaddafi, who was now gone, told the Arab League what happened in New York when this woman led prayer is going to create a million bin Ladens. Can you imagine? A hundred people peacefully praying 
are going to create a million bin Ladens. Gaddafi is the one who created a million bin Ladens by torturing and assassinating his opponents. But a woman who took for herself the right to be imam and people praying behind their woman imam was considered such a threat from the patriarchs and the dictators. So I am proud to have been a part of Amina Wadud's revolution.
that they want Muslim women to have. Just the right to wear niqab or hijab. What about the other rights? So they're same, same. They're mirror images of each other, which is, you know, the white men of the neo-Nazi groups, the Muslim men of the extremist groups, they give women one crumb and they keep the whole cake. And I always tell people I don't want the crumbs of patriarchy. I want the whole cake. Even better, I want to make my own cake. I refuse the crumbs of patriarchy. So I always fight the two extremisms, but I also fight the women who don't question those extremisms because what those women do is they internalize the misogyny of those groups, thinking that the crumbs that they are given will benefit them and thinking that this will protect them from that patriarchy. And nothing protects you from patriarchy. I tell this to white American women who voted for Donald Trump. Now in the United States, abortion might very soon become illegal. I tell this to the white women who voted for the neo-Nazi parties that pretend that domestic violence is just, they used in a protest pictures of American women victims, white American women victims of domestic violence, and said these were women who were victims of Muslim men. So they're liars and they're propagandists in the fight for patriarchal control of women's bodies. And the deck might, when I say we need a sexual revolution, I mean obviously around the world. But for me, the heart of the sexual revolution is saying, I own my body. Not the Muslim men anywhere, not the white men anywhere, not the patriarchy anywhere, because this is a fight against patriarchy. So my revolution begins with the declaration, I own my body. Not the state, not the street, not the home, not the church, or the mosque, or the family. I own my body. regardless of where you live. Because patriarchy is universal, it exists under the Communist Party in China, it exists under the democracy, or the two-party system rather, um, in the United States. Patriarchy exists under the royal family in Saudi Arabia, and there is patriarchy under the military dictatorship in Egypt. So I think what's more useful than saying Eastern or Western feminism is, is saying patriarchy, because patriarchy is universal. And as I said, when I first began and I described patriarchy like an octopus, I think maybe where things could be different is the kind of the descriptions of the various tentacles of the octopus. Because at the head is patriarchy, but in some countries it uses capitalism, in other countries it uses religion, but they're all there. So I think we must recognize that patriarchy uses the, those other oppressions and we must fight them all. Now, a, a term that has been used more recently is white feminism. And the reason that that term is being used is because to remind, especially white women, regardless of where they live, that we have to fight more than misogyny. This is an oversimplified way of describing white feminism, but I want to keep my, my answer as short as possible. Uh, feminism is about more than fighting misogyny. So we have to recognize that there's a whole host of oppressions and forms of discrimination that patriarchy uses, and regardless of where in the world we live, we must fight them all as a way of fighting that head of the octopus, which is patriarchal. <laughs> Más que yo, y así me aclaro un poco. Thank, thank you for recognizing that, as I said earlier, we should listen to the voice, or you should listen to the voice 
of women of Muslim descent. I am against the bans on hijab. I oppose bans on hijab anywhere. Um, 12 years ago, when France was the first country to ban the face veil, I support banning the face veil everywhere, but I oppose the groups who introduced the face veil ban because they are often racist, xenophobic, Islamophobic groups. But I no longer talk about those bans anymore because it's, it's very clear that a lot of the groups that want to talk about those bans are the right-wing, Islamophobic, xenophobic groups who pretend to care about Muslim women, but they don't. They want to weaponize this, this discussion against all Muslims and they pretend to care about Muslim women. So, I'm against niqab and I want to ban it all over the world, but I'm against those people. I also oppose hijab because I oppose something called modesty culture. So niqab, I believe, is a dangerous equation of women. Hijab doesn't erase women because I believe that the face is very important and you can still see the woman. But I oppose hijab, which is why I took it off, because I call hijab part of modesty culture. And modesty culture belongs in most religions. The Jewish faith, you see ultra-Orthodox Jewish women, they dress modestly. Uh, you see Chris, um, Christian nuns cover their hair and the same with Muslim women. So I oppose the hijab, but I also oppose the bans on hijab. So I, I hope that this is not something that is going to happen in Spain. I make a distinction between the two. Hola, buenas tardes. Antes que nada, felicidad de una por la extraordinaria conferencia. Bueno, yo me presento, soy Silvia, bueno, trabajo en tema, soy formadora en tema de igualdad. Mi marido es marroquí, yo dije, bueno, es musulmán, es de, de Marruecos, pero es español de nacionalidad. Yo soy feminista, no soy, vamos, me considero un medio ateo, me educaron en el cristianismo, como a mucha gente de la que estamos aquí. Y a mí me gustaría saber, porque hay una escritora, María Antonia García de León, que ella habla de que tenemos un corazón patriarcal encerrado en un cerebro eh, igualitario, feminista. ¿Cómo esa disonancia cognitiva, ese trabajo de, por ejemplo, yo me deconstruyo día a día, yo doy formación en igualdad, eh, en política de igualdad, y me gustaría saber cómo trabajar la interculturalidad conjugándolo contra la lucha contra el patriarcado, y también me gustaría saber cómo trabajar, porque ahora mismo estamos trabajando aquí, el trabajo con hombres, o sea, las masculinidades saludables, la educación emocional, esa educación emocional que se ha cansado en mayor medida de los hombres. ¿Cómo se trabaja? Porque es complicado trabajar con hombres, también musulmanes, con esa cultura, igual que aquí, también eh, es complicado, son masculinidades tóxicas, patriarcales. Me gustaría saber cómo trabajáis el tema de los hombres. Muchas gracias. Thank you for your kind words. I'm very glad to be here and I'm very glad to hear that you work on these issues because they are such important issues. I think it's, it's absolutely necessary for each and every single one of us to understand that we have internalized the patriarchy, just as you, uh, you so beautifully put through the quote. Every patriarchy lives in all of us and it, it is a daily struggle to recognize how we often act because we're socialized, we are raised in these things. This is not a feminist world. Patriarchy lives in every home and in every person. So I think it's a daily struggle to recognize how sometimes it, it seems like we're acting instinctively, but there's no such thing. We're acting according to the ways that we are socialized. And, it's very, and this is why I always say, focus on the hardest of struggles, which is the struggle that is nearest to you. And that is your own bedroom. That is your own home. Look at the dynamic that happens. I say that the dictator, the most dangerous dictator, and the most powerful of those dictators in my trifecta of misogyny, the state, the street, and the home, the most powerful is the one in the bedroom because all the dictators go home into the bedroom. So that, that is where the real struggle begins and emanates out into the world. So I think we need to develop daily disciplines of recognizing that internal patriarchy. It's one of the things that I do in my next book. My next book is called The Seven Necessary Sins for Women and Girls. And I look at attributes that patriarchy has told women and girls we're not allowed to want to do or to be. And I write about each one of those, instead of the seven deadly sins, as we know through Christianity, I call them seven necessary sins. And they are anger, attention-seeking, profanity, ambition, power, violence, and lust. And women and girls are not allowed any of those things, and we're not socialized in those things. And so I, I urge in my new book, 
women and girls to claim those things and to use them in what I call feminism in 3D. And this feminism in 3D is part of the way that we can develop a discipline to constantly look at the way that we've internalized patriarchy and misogyny. And those three Ds in feminism and 3D are defying, disobeying, and disrupting patriarchy. Because I'm often asked, especially by younger women, because sometimes I think people think that I emerged from my mother's womb saying, fuck the patriarchy. I wasn't born like this. It took years of fighting to recognize my own internalized patriarchy and to take it out like weeds, you know, when you grow a garden. Every day you have to take the weeds out. So every day I have to take the weeds of patriarchy out of me inside. So I tell them, look, I wasn't born like this, but try to fight, find ways every day where you can defy and disobey and disrupt patriarchy. In any way you can, in the simplest of forms, because that way you develop a discipline. That way you strengthen your feminist muscles. And this is especially important for men, because I think that men think that patriarchy is their friend. And patriarchy is the only a friend to a particular kind of man. And I'm glad you mentioned toxic masculinity. Because patriarchy, did not, unless you are a conservative, heteronormative, wealthy man, patriarchy will hurt you too. Patriarchy will hurt you, it will kill women, and it will also sometimes kill men for not behaving in the way that patriarchy demands. So men have to recognize that patriarchy is not their friend. Patriarchy denies them emotion, like you said. Patriarchy denies them the love uh, for each other. Patriarchy <coughs> denies men the ability to express sexual as well as affectionate love for each other. So they are denied too. They are denied a full human experience. Now, all my attention goes into the fight against patriarchy for women and girls, so I'm glad that there are people like you and others who, who remind men of this. But it's absolutely essential. And, and so one of the stories that I'll end my answer to you with is that in 2015, before I went on tour around the world to promote my book, when it came out in English, I got an invitation to go to speak at a university in Egypt in a very conservative town. It was a town that was dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood. And this group of university students there wanted to have a conference where they had many voices coming. And I got the invitation from a 19-year-old Egyptian man studying engineering at this university. And he emailed me to say, please come and speak at our conference because our community needs a feminist like you to shake us up. This is a man who recognizes that in his town in Egypt, patriarchy is denying him a full range of emotions that he deserves. And he also recognizes that we need to take these discussions outside of the capital city. Often all of these very, very noble discussions are in the capital. And he said, nobody wants to come out, very few people want to come out here because all the light is in Cairo. And all the focus is in Cairo, but we need these discussions in every part of our country. So for me as an Egyptian feminist, to be invited by a 19-year-old Egyptian man, that says to me that he recognizes the, the need, the absolute importance for the sexual revolution and the social revolution. Después del terrible atentado en Nueva Zelanda, que causó tantas muertes, la primera ministra neozelandesa, eh, que es una mujer además, Arden, que hoy Jacinda Arden, eh, en, eh, una de las cosas que sugirió eh, como respuesta de solidaridad, no sé si, si lo recuerdan, eh, fue que las mujeres no musulmanas acudieran a las mezquitas con el eh, hijab de manera que todas se confundieran. De alguna manera, yo también soy musulmana, yo también soy objeto de tu ira. Eh, eh, ese podía haber sido él, eh, no el, el discurso. Pero fue muy criticado. Eh, fue muy criticado como eh, un gesto de eh, paternalismo eh, por parte de las mujeres blancas neozelandesas. Y sin embargo, en el fondo, era un gesto de igualdad por encima de las discrepancias. Como, como, I think in order to answer your question, I must begin first of all with asking what was behind the massacre in New Zealand. And the massacre in New Zealand was committed by a man who is a white supremacist, who is Islamophobic, and who used the rhetoric of white supremacists and Islamophobes like Donald Trump 
and other extremist politicians in Australia to massacre 51 Muslims at play. So if I want to show solidarity with the Muslim community, the best way to show solidarity is to fight white supremacy and to fight Islamophobia. Otherwise, anything I do is going to become an empty and naive gesture that happens over one or two hours and it makes the white women who wore the hijab in solidarity think that they have done something tremendous. I show them solidarity with Muslim women. It shows that I'm not racist. It shows I'm not Islamophobic. Now, I appreciate wanting to show solidarity. That is really important because this is a terrible time. But you don't show solidarity with such, I believe, such an empty, naive gesture, especially having now said so many times, if you're not a woman of Muslim descent, shut up and listen to Muslim women when it comes to the hijab. Because to equate the hijab with Muslim women is exactly what I'm fighting against. I am saying I am more than my hijab. So who are you, Jacinda Ardern and the white women of New Zealand, to say that I am equal to my hijab? That is exactly what I'm fighting against. And again, this is because of what I said earlier, where it's so much easier to say, ah, we Muslim women, let's go over there and fight them, other than fight what's over here. They're, oh, it's so shit over there, and you forget that it's shit over here. What is shit over here for New Zealand? White supremacy, Islamophobia. So rather than this empty naive gesture for one hour or two hours or 24 hours, one day out of 365, I want the white people of New Zealand to take gestures 365 days a year by fighting their relatives and friends who are white supremacists and who are Islamophobic. This is how we help the Muslim community. And lastly, the majority of people who were massacred in the mosque in New Zealand were men, because the men entered the, the men's section. How do you show solidarity for Muslim men? They didn't show me that they're showing solidarity for Muslim men. So they're basically taking the entire Muslim community and reduced it to I'm gonna wear a headscarf for two hours. I oppose this completely. I urge everyone who is not a Muslim today to fight white supremacy and Islamophobia because that's the way that you truly show solidarity. And if you are outside and you see a Muslim woman in a headscarf, in hijab, as I said, this is a woman who is visibly Muslim, and you see someone attacking her, you can show solidarity not by wearing a hijab, but by intervening and going to help her against this Islamophobia. That's the best way to show solidarity to women in hijab. But to all Muslims, fight Islamophobia and fight white supremacy. And thank you for your question.